It is a joy to worship God on His holy day, to worship God on this uh, Christian Sabbath. Brethren, one of the most uh, important things that we can dwell upon is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as mentioned earlier, as we uh, come closer and closer, now just one day away, from the day of Christmas, and we think about this holiday, and it's even mentioned by the pagans, as mentioned earlier as well, that this is about Christ. What specifically, though, comes to mind when we think about Christmas in its essence? What, what is it that comes to our minds when we think about the Christmas holiday? What is at the heart of it? It's celebration, that is. Surely it is not the presence or perhaps a, a mythical character uh, by the name of Santa Claus or even uh, time with family. It's not even about family necessarily. But what is it about? Well, it's about one particular doctrine. One particular truth that is put forth in Scripture, and it is an important one. And it is the truth of the Incarnation. The doctrine of the Incarnation is what is at the heart of the Christian season, of the Christmas season. That's what it is about. It is about God Himself coming down and dwelling <coughs> among men, ultimately to save men. And so that is what I want to consider this morning. The doctrine of the Incarnation. The, the truth that God Himself was manifested in the flesh. That the second person of the Trinity was made for a time as a man and lived among men. And experienced what men experience so that He might be <coughs> Savior of men. And so I want to consider this morning four truths about the Incarnation. Four aspects of the Incarnation, we might say, of this doctrine. One is I want to consider the need for the Incarnation. Also the time of the Incarnation. The essence of the Incarnation. And the purpose. The purpose of the Incarnation. I want to consider those four things. And so let us first consider the need for the Incarnation. The need for the Incarnation. Firstly, it is our separation for God that necessitates Incarnation. That necessitates God coming down and dwelling among men. As Ephesians chapter 2 clearly says in verse 12, Paul tells the Ephesians, he says, remember that you were at that time, he's speaking of when they were lost, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Man is separated from God. And this is true. When, when we are born, we are born in a state of sin, yes, and in enmity with God. And as Paul says, we are separated from Christ. We are excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. We are strangers. Strangers. We do not know God as we ought to. And then because, therefore, because of that, we have no hope and we are without God in the world. In this life, the lost man experiences separation from God. And not only that, but because of our sin, we await eternal separation from God. From God's mercy, God's glory. Paul elsewhere tells the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. He says of the wicked, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of His power. So not only does the lost person experience a separation from God in this life. An exclusion from the life of God that they are cut off. But even in the, in the life that is to come, man is separated from God. This 
necessitates incarnation. That God comes down. Because if God does not bridge the gap, as it were, if God does not condescend to, to bring man unto himself, he will never be reconciled to God. He will be forever excluded. Forever excluded. Scripture in the Old Testament specifically talks about being cut off from God. And that references physical death, but it carries with it more than that. It's being separated from the Holy One. It's not just, oh, you die. It's that you are separated from God. That you don't experience the benefits of being near to God and being intimate with God. Rather, you are cut off from God's life. There are many people who are living, but they're not really living. There are many people who are alive, but they're not truly alive. They are walking around, they are living their lives, but they are dead. Because they are spiritually dead. Why? Because they are separated from God. You know where we see this happen, brethren, in history? In the garden. Man sins, what immediately happens? God, in His perfect justice, Casts man out of the garden and sets up an angel to guard the entrance with a flaming sword. Man is now cut off from the presence of God. And therefore, in order to restore this communion with God that was there present in the garden, to restore that, there has to be God Himself condescending, stooping down, humbling himself to save those sinners. We are in this state by birth, by inheritance. But not only are we separated from God, we can look at it from that angle, but then to also consider the aspect of God's holiness, God is separated from us. God has been separated from us. And we find this in Scripture when it talks about God's holiness. Because the word holy means to be sacred, to be set apart. To be separate from that which is evil. God is called holy many times in Scripture. In fact, uh, the book of Leviticus is about holiness. It's all about holiness. The book of Leviticus is packed with references to holiness. In fact, it uses the term holy over 80 times. That's just in the book of Levit Leviticus. Many, many, many other times the scriptures speak of God's holiness. God is separate from the sinner. It's not just that the sinner has separated himself because of his sin. Mankind has not been separated because of his sin. God has separated himself from the wicked. God has made Himself set apart. For He is. He has always been. He has always been the Holy One. And therefore He is actively at enmity with the evil, with the wicked. Scripture says in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is Revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. God's wrath is being revealed from heaven. We know the scripture tells us God is angry with the wicked every day. There is a war going on between God and the sinner. There is great need for a mediator. There is great need for incarnation to take place. Otherwise, there will not be reconciliation between God and man. So man is separated from God, God from man. And there is also 
a need for a specific kind of mediator. A specific kind of incarnation must take place. One where God himself is present, and yet man is also present in one person. There must be a person who possesses the full character of God, who is truly God, yet he is also truly man. And that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we know. And we will consider that a little later on. As 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Only one. How can Christ be a mediator between God and man? Because he possesses both natures. There is a duality with Jesus' natures. He has his human nature and his divine nature. Christ is called in Scripture the Son of Man. Jesus himself calls himself that many times to stress his humanity. And then he is also called the Son of God in Scripture. There is need for the incarnation because the mediator that has to stand between God and man has to be both God and man. If Jesus, before his incarnation, attempted to stand between God and man, he could not because he was not man. But when he became man, he was now fit to stand between God and man. Jesus himself called himself the Son of Man in Matthew 28, or excuse me, Matthew 20, 28. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Also in the same book of Matthew, Matthew 16, Jesus is called the Son of God by Peter. One of the, one of very, one of the most famous passages in the book of Mark Oftentimes we refer to this passage as Peter's confession. Peter's confession of faith in Christ. In verse 16 it says, Simon Peter answered, You are the Son, or excuse me, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, Peter affirms the deity of Jesus. The, the, that He is divine. And what does Jesus say back? And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's a divine truth. The truth that Jesus is the Son of God. The incarnation is so necessary because the mediator had to be truly God, truly man. Very God, very man. If a mere man tried to stand between God and man, he could not stand before God. Why? Because he was not divine. He was not perfect. No man is. However, if, if, if Jesus, as I said a moment ago, before his incarnation, attempted to stand between God and man as mediator, in that way it would not have worked at that time, for he could not stand in relation to man. He could not, as it says in Hebrews 4, sympathize with their weaknesses. But we know that Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses. For he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet he was without sin. And so there is a dire need for a mediator. The second thing I'd like to consider is the time of the incarnation. The time the incarnation. It was at the fullness of the times. It was at the right time. It wasn't arbitrarily picked by God, as it were. And Jesus was not born at that time because it was at random. It was at the perfect time. Paul says it this way in Galatians 4. Verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law. 
that we might receive the adoption as sons. The fullness of the time. In other words, Paul's saying, at that right time, when Jesus came, it was the fullness of the time, it was the perfect time. In fact, if the Lord Christ was born a day later, a day early, it would not have been right. But as we know, God's providence controls all things. And so he ordered it to be on that very day. That very night. All the events were perfectly orchestrated by God's providential hand. They were formed by, as clay, as it were. By the potter's hand. It was so ordered that the shepherds would be out in those fields that night. It was so ordered that Mary and Joseph would be turned away from the inn and would have to go to a stable. And Christ would be born in a feeding trough. That's what it was. Sometimes we kind of glorify it with all these nativity sets. It's, oh, it's so adorable and so sweet. It would have been very nasty. That's where the slop and gross food was. Why? Because Christ humbled himself. He wasn't just born of man. He was born into a poor family. He was born in a humble state. The king of glory was not born as a king. He was not born... In vestal garments. He was not born in a beautiful palace. Rather, in a stable amongst animals, probably. It was at the right time. And at that time in history, if we want to go further and not just talk about that night, but that specific geopolitical climate there that was taking place in Israel at that time, was the perfect time for the Lord Christ to be, to be born. For everything had been orchestrated, even from the creation of the world, to come to this point. We could say that the life of Christ, the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, is, is all the centerpiece of history. All of it together. One perfect man, one perfect life, the God-man, that's the centerpiece of history. And if it had been at any other time, in any other culture, the prophecies would not have been fulfilled. You've, made, you've heard me reference this before. There are hundreds <coughs> of prophecies given in the Old Testament about Jesus, about the Messiah, about what He is going to do when He comes. Some of them have yet to be fulfilled because they reference Jesus' second coming. But a lot of them have already been fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. Hundreds. I want to consider four prophecies that specifically relate to Jesus' birth, that were fulfilled in His birth. Well, three of them really have to do with His birth, and the fourth one has to do with His mission, His coming mission. To the world. The first one I'd like to consider is that he would be born in Bethlehem. In Matthew 2, if you turn there with me, Matthew 2. Very interesting passage. Beginning in verse 1. And this is a, a passage that is often turned to when one thinks about Christmas, the Christmas season. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes and the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And we ought to know that that was fulfilled. We know that the Magi went to Jesus' 
birthplace and found the child. He had been born in Bethlehem. Interestingly enough, what does the word Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All interesting nuances that point to the Christ. But also, a Bethlehem is the city of David. Jesus was of David's lineage. Which is the second thing I want to consider. The second prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus' birth was that he would be of David's lineage. And for us to find this prophecy, we actually have to go back to the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you turn there with me, 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll begin in verse 14. Now this is what uh, many people would call the Davidic covenant, where God makes a covenant with David. And it is, it has the, the language structure as a covenant. In fact, even my Bible above verse 8 in this chapter says God's covenant with David. But verse 14, or actually we'll, we'll, um, we'll begin in verse 12 just to get a little bit of a background. Verse 12 says, and God speaking here to David, when your days are completed, you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, when I removed, uh, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Let me ask you, brethren. Was David's throne established forever? Yes, it was. Was his physical throne? No, it wasn't. This prophecy, it has aspects that talk about, for example, it says he will build a house for me. That's talking about Sam, I mean, that's talking about um, his son, Solomon, who built the second temple. Solomon's temple. Or excuse me, the first temple, Solomon's temple. However, God gives another promise, and he says, Your throne will be forever. And we know Jesus was called the Son of David. He fulfilled it. Christ is the son of David. This covenant God made with David was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus' coming. Because Christ comes as the king. He is born as king. What did the Magi ask? The king of the Jews. They said, where is the king of of the Jews. You can imagine how that would have infuriated her. <clears throat> Jesus, the King of the Jews. More than the King of the Jews, the King of all people, the King of all ages, the King of glory. Jesus sits on the throne of his father David right now. There is a particular theological stance that states that Jesus is not sitting, won't sit as king until after he returns. Brethren, he sits as king right now. He's king now. Jesus himself told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. See, if we look at this prophecy only in the physical realm, only in the physical dimension, we're going to say, I don't see how that was fulfilled. But we must consider the spiritual reality. That Christ is the Son of David. Thirdly, I want us to consider, going back a little further into the Old Testament, that Jesus was born of Abraham's lineage. He was a Jew. He was born Jewish. And for that, we have to go back to Genesis, all the way to the first book of the Bible. Genesis 22 In verses uh, 15 through 18. 
And this is an interesting passage because this is right after uh, Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac and God stops that from happening. As we know, God providentially calls that to happen uh, where it was stopped. <coughs> In fact, just to give some context, I'll start in verse 9. Excuse me. Then it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the, the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies and your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. We know from Galatians 3, Paul writes in Galatians 3, that the seed that is spoken of in verse 18 is different than the seed that's spoken of in verse 17. Verse 17, God says, I'm going to multiply your seed. I'm going to make you have many descendants. We know that came true. You had a great nation. The nation of Israel. Then he says, and in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And Paul even points that out in Galatians 3. He says, it was, God used the singular. He said, your seed, one, singular, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see this tapestry going on in Scripture? This interweaving of these concepts. All the scripture testifies to this glory, to this powerful message that Christ is the Savior. He is the seed of Abraham, the one in whom all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. We know that Jesus has redeemed the people for himself from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Fourthly, the fourth prophecy that came to be fulfilled in Jesus' birth and in Jesus' life uh, in the greater, uh, greater scheme, in the greater uh, grand picture of Jesus' life is that He would be the Savior of His people. He was born as a Savior. He was certainly born as prophet, as messenger. He was born as king. He was born as ruler. He was born as the Son of God and the Son of Man, but specifically, and really that comes to the, the forefront of our minds when we think about the birth of Christ, ought to be that He was born to be Savior. He came for a specific purpose. There's a singular goal, and it's to save His people. It says in Isaiah 53, 11, as a result of the anguish of the soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the man as he will bear their iniquities. What did he come to do? Justify the many. We know that Jesus later in Luke 19.10 said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. When we talk about salvation, who is seeking? Who is saving? The Son of God. Jesus seeks and Jesus saves. As I told you earlier about my friend uh, who I, whom I've been uh, discussing spiritual things with and been exhorting him to come to Christ. 
If he's already been saved, do you know why he was saved? Because Christ sought him out. Jesus sought him out and saved him. Why? Because he was born for that very purpose. Thirdly, I'd like for us to consider the essence of the Incarnation. The essence of the Incarnation. This is something I've made mention of already, but just to dig into it a little deeper. The essence of the Incarnation is simply this. I could sum it up in three words. God with us. God with us. And I derive that specifically from the book of Matthew, which is where I was reading from just a moment ago. And interestingly enough, it's the first chapter of the New Testament. The first chapter of the New Testament we find this. Matthew 1. Verse 21, I'll, I'll read uh, to give a little bit of context. The angel is speaking to Joseph in his dream. Telling him about, uh, really how he doesn't have to worry. That, that Christ's uh, birth is... His, his, his birth is a divine uh, it's a divine act. It's not something that uh, Mary caused to happen because she committed adultery. As it even says in verse 20, he says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. Now all this. Now notice this. Mark, Matthew ends the quotation there from the angel. Verse 21. And then Matthew adds his own commentary. It's as if he's saying, take note. Listen up, readers. Here's what just happened. Verse 22. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Now here, here is the essence of Christmas. Verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. That's out of Isaiah. God with us. In that phrase, those three words is contained the essence, the message of of the gospel itself and what this Christmas season is all about. That God, the almighty creator, sustainer, upholder of all things, the Holy One, the righteous God, the God of such love for His people, comes down and dwells among men so that He might be a mediator between both God and man and might redeem a people to Himself for His own glory. I said earlier, in order for someone to be mediator, in order for there to be the right mediator, he has to be both truly God and truly man. He cannot be both one or the other. He has to be truly God and truly man. And so we find that Jesus is God with us. God with men. You see that? He bridges the gap. He pulls them together, as it were, and man and God are now united in Christ. They are now unified because the Son of God has come to redeem sinners, to reconcile them to God and God to them. To put away their sin and to put away the wrath of God against them for it. And so that therefore sinners might be now the sons and the daughters of God. That's the essence of the Incarnation. And it is sadly denied by many so-called Christians. Our friends, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they deny that Jesus, they deny His full divinity in this sense. Jehovah's Witnesses say He certainly was not God, and the Mormons kind of twist and convolute it even more so, and they say, well, yes, He was divine, but the, their idea of God is not really the biblical idea of God. They think of God as an A-God and kind of a lesser God. You can have lesser and greater gods. Whereas Scripture just says God is God. You're either God or you're not God. There's no hierarchy. Many cults will deny this truth. And it's a simple truth. A passage that's very telling of this truth is also in, in John chapter 1. The first chapter of John says, 
Uh, many of you have heard this before read. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. Verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For of His fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. That's powerful. The Word among us. Fourthly, the last point I'd like to make the purpose of the Incarnation. The purpose of the Incarnation. And I may mention of it just very briefly a moment ago. Our reconciliation to God and His reconciliation to us. And I started out talking about that. Man is separated from God. God is separated from man. There is a vast chasm that divides them. But now to bring it full circle, we come back to the purpose of the Incarnation. It is to put that away. It is to now have God and man reconcile one to another. And there's one passage specifically I'd like to focus on. And I'd invite you to turn there with me in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Beginning in verse 6. Romans 5, 6. Paul says this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. What's this text saying? God and man are reconciled one to another. First, he speaks about our relation. To God. What is he saying? Verse 6. At the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He's talking about us. We are ungodly. Set apart from God. Verse 8. What does he say? God demonstrates his unlove towards us though. And while we are yet sinners, Jesus dies for us. And therefore, we are justified, as he says in verse 9, by his blood. So here we have Paul talking about our relation. To God. We are now reconciled. Then he says this at the end of verse 9. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So we have now God is reconciled to man. God's wrath is now removed. He no longer has a, an anger, a wrath, a vengeance against the sinner. It's put away. And now he can bestow a, a riches of grace, saving mercy upon them because he and his son has authorized it.
And then he goes back to talking about us again. Verse 10. Uh, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. We are now ministers. We are now recipients of the ministry of reconciliation. Of having been made right with God and God having been made right with us. Not that there's anything wrong with God. It's not God. It's not He Himself as if He has a flaw in His character. It's His holy justice that must be put away. In order for us to ever stand before Him. And praise be to Him that He did put it away justly. So brethren, I exhort you in light of these truths to meditate, to meditate upon them. Today and tomorrow, the rest of your week, to let these realities have bearing upon your mind and your life, for they will transform you. Not only to think about them, though, but to apprehend them by faith. What I mean by that is to grab them by faith, to take them captive by faith, to own them by faith. As Jacob wrestled with the angel and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Let us likewise wrestle with these truths until we are <clears throat> blessed from on high. Until our souls are encouraged and edified. You fathers, my encouragement to you is to lead your families, especially during this, Christ this Christmas holiday. I'd encourage you to read out of one of the portions of Scripture perhaps that I've read out or another one uh, out of Luke. Luke is a wonderful uh, narrative of the, of the nativity story. And to lead your family in worship during this time, during this Christ Christmas season. You mothers likewise to support your husbands in this endeavor. And to joyfully receive their instruction. To joyfully worship the Lord Christ alongside them. The incarnate God. You children. To likewise look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And to make Him your chief joy. To make Him your meditation. Both day and day. And night. And you who know not Christ, He bids you through His Word, through the outward call of the Gospel, to come and have life. The incarnate God says, Come. He commands the seas to go only so far as they will go. As I said earlier, He commands the sun to rise and to set. And if He gives you a command, you ought to obey it. And in His Word, He has given the command, repent and believe the Gospel. You who say you know Christ, but do not, the command is also the same. Repent and believe the Gospel. Abandon your hypocrisy. You may think you, you know Christ, but you live like Herod. don't know him, if that is true of you. But even this day, he calls you, he bids you to come. And even he bids his people, he bids his sheep to rest and to trust in the shepherd of their souls. So we have seen here the need for the Incarnation. We have seen the time of the Incarnation. We have seen the essence of the Incarnation. And the purpose of the Incarnation. The God who caused all these things to come about, as said earlier, is holy. 
And we are, by default, as I said at the outset, at enmity with Him and deserving of hell. But blessed be God that the Incarnation did take place. That Christ dwelt among men and died, bearing the wrath of God for their sin, and was raised on the third day and is seated in glory. And the promise of the Gospel is that those who come to this Christ, to the bread of life, who was born in the house of bread, will be saved, forgiven of sin, wrapped in the garments of His righteousness, all by grace. And their lives will be changed. Christ came to save men from their sin. To save them from slavery to sin. Not just the effect of sin in the life to come, but slavery to sin in this life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life are obliterated by the power of the gospel. Christ came to save those who were lost. And those who are truly saved are changed forevermore. And this gospel, praise be God, is praise be to God, is not only for those who are outside of Christ, but those who are in his kingdom, for our encouragement and our edification. Because as we consider, as we think about we've been, how we've been saved by grace and how God has redeemed us. Our hearts erupt with joy. We are filled with awe and with a desire to worship the living God who has saved us by His grace for His glory. And that's ultimately the purpose, the glory of God. So may God be glorified in this Christmas season in each of our lives and in all things forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the incarnation. How weighty. How powerful. How wonderful is this truth. That God was manifest in the flesh. Father, we praise you. I pray that your word would have its desired effect upon each of us. And that you be glorified in that. In Jesus' name, amen.